Okay, so tonight is business combinations. So, one of the things that we sent out to you ahead of time, I think, was the Deloitte Roadmap book. All right, you guys get that? You guys, man, it's so bad. <laughs> it's only because I'm apathetic that I don't quiz you more on the reading. Um, that book is... So, so here's my two cents on the reading. When you read the actual ASC 740 guidance, it's so hard to understand. You know, it's just written in a very non-user-friendly sort of way. You know, it's written in this kind of principle-based sort of language, which doesn't lend itself well to learning. But when you read some of these guidebook type excerpts, it's, it's, you can understand it. So, like I said, this topic will be on the exam. You're going to need to understand it. So after the course tonight, you're going to want to go back to that roadmap guide, probably more so than the actual ASC 740 guidance. It's just it's organized by topic as opposed to kind of however you want to say that the ASC 740 is organized. Um, and it's just a little more intuitive and written in a way that's more user-friendly. So, so tonight's class is entirely on how to do accounting for um, acquisitions. Okay? And um, this is unlike maybe the first six classes where we talked about really how to, how to do a basic provision. This class, as well as the next two, are, are more one-offs. And so um, this class will not like weave into the next one. The next one will be about how to do quarterly provisions. And then the class after that will be international taxes and how those are reflected in provisions. So the, this class and the next two are very like standalone, subject-oriented type of courses. Okay? Um, so in Silicon Valley, there's a ton of acquisition activity, right? Um, I mean, it is, a, it is stunning, like, how many companies are acquiring other companies and, and how fast the pace of change is around here. So if you work at a company, either you're going to end up acquiring somebody or being acquired. I mean, that is almost a certainty uh, with, you know, very few exceptions. So um, when I think about my clients and, and kind of what they're like, uh, when you look at, uh, like, Yahoo probably acquired in the last 12 months, I'll bet they acquired 15 companies. And so what we'll cover tonight, you know, we took some of those concepts and applied it 15 times. And some concepts apply to certain deals, other concepts to other deals, but in general, there's kind of a pool of, of rules that we'll draw from and we'll apply them to those transactions. Um, you know, one of my, uh, one of my other clients is uh, Cadence Design Systems, and they, uh, I want to say they've done like 30 or 40 acquisitions in their life. I mean, they have this little chart on one of their conference room walls of all the deals they've done. And it's typical of Valley companies, you know, they're just very acquisitive, right? If we try to figure out, like, how many Oracle acquisitions there were, you know, it's like a Pac-Man game where they're just, like, eating up those little dots, you know, they just keep eating companies up. So you, so the point is, you will, you will see this in practice, right? This isn't some novelty that, you know, you're not going to see. If you work on provisions, you work at a public company or a public firm, you will see the stuff, guaranteed. Okay. So the way that we're going to cover this in class tonight is we are going to go through kind of these steps. Yep. We're going to spend, spend more time in certain sections than others, but you'll see that the first section is not even a tax accounting topic so much as it is just a tax topic of understanding what kind of acquisition it is. Okay. So the first thing we have to do to be successful in doing tax accounting for acquisitions is understand the acquisition to begin with. Okay, so not all acquisitions are the same. In fact, there's a variety of different forms of acquisitions. Um, they can be structured differently. It can be different types of companies. Um, so you really, as a provision person, need to know what happened, what is the transaction, before you can know how to account for it. Okay, so we're going to start with that, and then we'll get into some of the accounting rules in terms of how acquisitions are accounted for. All right. Actually, I'm going to skip through a couple of these things. Let me hop right to. Um, let me hop right to this. Okay, so throughout. Tonight, we're going to assume that we're the buyer, okay? Because Target, you know, they just collect their money and they go sit on a beach. There's not much accounting and provision work they need to do. So they work is with the buyer, okay? 
And um, so think of, as, as you hear kind of stories tonight and concepts, think of yourself as, I'm the buyer, what am I doing? What do I care about, right? I'm, a, I'm an acquiring company that has my own provision, and now I gotta weave in this target into my own. Okay, we gotta combine them, basically. So if you're a buyer and you're doing an acquisition, there's a couple things that we need to understand, okay? So the first is, you gotta understand what kind of company that you're buying. You know, what's the tax status of the target? Okay. Is the target a corporation? Is it a flow-through? Um, that in and of itself, super basic question, will make a big difference in terms of how the accounting is going to work. Okay. Second question, are we, are we acquiring the assets of a company or are we acquiring the stock of a company? Okay. Those are easily the two most basic questions you're going to want to ask from the get-go. Okay. What kind of company am I acquiring? And am I acquiring its assets or its stock? And when I think of acquisitions, I think of this little box here as these are the four types of possible acquisitions. And so <clears throat> you, could, you could have an, an acquisition that fits within the intersection of any of these um, rows and columns. Okay? And so let's kind of go through each of these boxes and talk about what would happen from a tax perspective. Forget accounting, just think tax. Okay? Think like a tax person. <coughs> So if I'm a buyer, right, think of from a buyer's perspective, um, do I want to buy assets or stock? What do I want to buy? It's not a trick question. You want to buy assets. So Hop says assets. Why does Hop say assets? So Hop says assets because he says he wants depreciation. Okay? And so implicit in Hop's statement is that when you buy assets, you get to step up the basis in the assets and depreciate your purchase price, right? Forget tax. Why do business people want to buy stock or assets? Pretend there is no tax. Still not a trick question. Why does a buyer want to buy stock versus assets? Or assets versus stock? So liabilities, right? That's the biggie. So if a buyer acquires the stock of a company, it inherits everything that comes along with that company. Where if a buyer acquires assets, he just bought the assets. Right? So if you're buying like a gas station and you say, all right, I'm just buying, you know, the, the building and the little, you know, gas machine, whatever you call those things, and, but I'm not assuming any of your liabilities. So if you dumped gas in the ground for the last 20 years, that's not my problem. All I bought is assets. Right? So that's the way to buy something where you're not sure what the liabilities are that could come with it. So the seller, he doesn't want to sell just assets. He wants to get rid of the liabilities, right? And so there's tension between the parties because what one wants, the other, <coughs> you know, doesn't want typically. And so that's part of the negotiation. <clears throat> the, the tax consequences of an asset sale versus a stock sale are totally different, though, right? There's a huge difference. And so let's, let's talk about when you buy and sell assets versus buy and sell stock, what, what happens here? And I should define these terms here for you when I say taxable and non-taxable. This is at the asset level. Okay, and that'll make a little more sense when I describe this in a bit. Okay. So let's go in the order of most Frequent acquisition forms. So if you go out and look in the newspaper and you read about acquisitions, of these four boxes, what type of acquisition, at least in this area, Silicon Valley, what do you see the most of? What type of acquisition do you see? Stock. So do you see that... Um, yeah, so it, you would see this would be the most common. 
Okay. And the reason is, is that this is where we're going to get the most kind of benign tax consequences to the seller. Okay. And I'll explain that in a second. In fact, maybe I'll just explain it now. So the most kind of fundamental thing with acquisitions is, let's say that um, I'm a, let's say that uh, you're a buyer and I'm a seller, and um, we can either do a stock transaction or we can do an asset transaction. Okay. So let's say that I own stock in a company, and I would sell you um, my stock for a hundred bucks. Okay, so if I got a hundred dollars and I paid capital gains, what are capital gains rates now? Are they twenty-five or twenty? Twenty, right? Twenty. Let's assume it's twenty. So I would keep eighty bucks. Okay. So let's assume that, um, let's say that I have no basis in my stock. So I sell it for 100, I have 100 a gain, I pay tax of 20%, so I get to keep 80. 80 is what I net from the transaction. Okay? And the buyer, because he bought stock, he gets no step up. Meaning the purchase price the buyer paid of 100 that doesn't become uh, basis in assets, it becomes basis in my shares, which is generally not worth much to anybody. Okay? So buyer's going to say, well, that's a bummer, right? If buyers hop, buyer's going to be like, I don't like that, right? I want to I wanna buy assets. Okay? So if, if buyer said, okay, fine, I want to buy your assets, then I would get to step up the basis in the assets and depreciate or amortize the 100. And over time, if my tax rate's 35%, I would save 35 in tax. So if I'm a buyer, saving 35 of tax here versus not getting any step up, that's a pretty big difference, right? So the buyer is going to say, I want to buy assets. Because right? if I'm going to pay 100 bucks, I might as well get the best bang for my buck and save 35 while I'm at it. But the seller is going to say, well, if it was an asset purchase, then the first thing that happens is you have corporate level tax. So let's say there's no basis in the assets. So f the first thing I have to do is pay tax at 35% at the corporate level. So I'm only left with $65 at the corporate level after I sell my assets from my, my company, my corporation. So then if that corporation then gives me, the shareholder, that $65, I'm taxed on the 65 at 20%. So I keep... 52. I net 52. Right? So you should have learned this in your corporate class. And this is double tax. Right? So I pay tax once here and then again here. So if I'm the seller, I'm going to say, hey, no way. I'm not taking 52. I thought we had a deal at 80. All right? So you can see the tension because what buyer is sitting here saying is, well, look, between these two scenarios, I save 35 bucks. And seller is going to say, well, between these two, I suffer 28. Right, And so you would think that the parties could kind of work out some sort of middle ground. Right? So what's the real 
what's the zinger in all this? Why is it not that simple? Does anyone know? When do you pay this tax, this extra tax? When does that get paid? Now is the answer. No, sorry, not your name. That's the answer to the <laughs> question. <laughs> Man, that's got to happen to you more than once, huh? So, when the seller sells this company, gets his cash, it pays tax now, right? So the seller would pay 28 more now if we structured it as an asset deal versus as a stock deal. This 35, when do I save this 35? Most likely. What do you think, Sam? The year you amortize uh, the asset, right? So, what, how many years does it take you to amortize an acquired intangible? 15, right? 15 years. So, really, you're not saving 35. You're saving 35 if there's no... Uh, if there's no interest rate, right? If there's no cost of money. But whenever there's some sort of interest rate, you'd really have to look at that 35 and say, I'd have to take the net present value of the 35 to put it in today's terms in order to compare it with this 28. And <clears throat> when, once you do that, this number here will be lower than the tax that the seller has to pay. So once you put this on MPV terms, the seller's going to say, look, this is a no-win game, right? The only person winning here is the government, right? The buyer could keep paying more to make the seller whole, but all they would be doing is, is, bless you, is allowing seller to pay more tax now so that, so that buyer could save tax later. But that's not a good strategy, right? In general, on your individual returns, you're not trying to pay tax now to save it later, right? And that's the same thing with M&A transactions. So usually, um, once the parties come to grip with what the economics are, and once they get, get a handle on the whole double tax situation, right, once people appreciate this dynamic, most transactions are structured this way. Because it's more efficient to give the seller his 80 than to try to go save that 35 at the expense of paying the 28. Okay. So that's not always the case, but that is the most, that's the most common fact pattern. Okay. So when will this be totally different? When will that logic not apply at all? This, this, this assumes that seller has a C-corp, right? Which most valley companies are formed as C-corps, right? Because they have venture, venture uh, investments, and venture investments generally require C-corps. I mean, that's typical. But if, if I own my business through an LLC that was a flow-through, I wouldn't have two layers of tax. I'd have one layer of tax, right? <coughs> And in that situation, it works out much differently because it's way more efficient for um, this number right here. This number is going to be a lot smaller in an asset transaction where um, it's a flow through. And the reason is I'm only paying one layer of tax whether I sell stock or I sell assets. Okay? And so... I'm not generally paying this corporate layer here. I'm generally only paying this. But usually, in a flow-through structure, the seller's paying the same tax regardless of whether they're selling assets or stock. So the seller, in that case, is almost ambivalent. And the buyer's going to say, oh, we love you. You're making our life easier because now we can structure this as an asset deal and we don't have to deal with you trying to get more purchase price and solve your tax problems because we know your structure puts you in a good place. Okay. 
So when we started this conversation, we said you got to find out what kind of entity you are. One reason for that is what kind of entity you are is going to directly impact the way that an acquisition is structured. Okay. From a provision perspective, what we're ultimately going to care about, we are going to care about whether we get a step up. Here we get no step up. Here we get a step up. That will matter to us when we do our provision. Okay. So we need to know which box we end up in to do our provision ultimately. Okay. okay. So if we go back to our little chart here. So a stock transaction. So the most common one is where it's non-taxable, which means no 338 election. A 338 election, for those of you who don't know what that is, just means in some acquisitions where you acquire stock, you can elect to treat it like an asset purchase. No step up. So the next most typical type of acquisition, I would say that the percentage of these that, if you, if you got a sample of 100 acquisitions and you tried to guess what percentage were in this category, I would say at least 80%. And when we do our problems tonight, we're going to focus on this box, because okay? that's what's out there. The next most common type is um, taxable asset acquisitions and this is usually going to be where the target is either it's either a, um, a sub of another company we'll call it sub of big co so when you buy a subsidiary of a big company it's efficient to buy it sometimes as an asset as opposed to stock or it's a flow through like that LLC I described earlier Here, the key is we get a step up. So if we pay $100 for the assets of a company, our basis in those assets is 100 If we paid $100 for a company and we were down in this box here in the right corner, our basis in the assets is whatever the basis in the assets was the day before we bought them. It doesn't change. Okay. So I would say that of the rest, call that 15%. A very tiny minority is in one of these two boxes. A non-taxable asset acquisition would be things, if you guys have had your like advanced corporate class, this would be like an A merger. Or, you know, any kind of reorg would be in here. So like a C or a D reorg. But pretty rare. You see many of these. A taxable stock acquisition would be an acquisition of shares with a 338 election. You see that all the time for foreign acquisitions, but rarely for domestic acquisitions. Okay. So through this messy slide, I just want you to appreciate that it's the economics of a deal, generally, that drive the structure. I mean, that makes sense. And that structure is going to drive certain consequences. The consequences we're going to care about will be whether or not there's a step up, and then also whether or not the historical attributes of a, of a target carry over to the buyer's term. Okay. So if we go back to this page, for example, so let's say our target has NOLs. If I'm in this common box down here in the bottom right, does the buyer get the NOLs for the target? NOLs, yes. If I'm in this next most common box, this taxable asset acquisition, do I get the NOLs? No. Okay. An asset acquisition is like a start over. Right? Stock acquisition is I'm basically inheriting whatever they had before, whether it's good news, bad news, whatever. Okay? So they're complete opposites. Questions about that?
since I know you're focused on like what's going to be on the final, the box in the lower right, that's what's going to be on the final. Alright. Okay, so now we've decided we're in the lower right, okay? We now, we've learned two things, right? We've learned why that most of the acquisitions are stock acquisitions, and the answer is double tax. And we learned that if we're in that lower right uh, box, we don't get a step up in the basis of our assets, and we inherit NOLs, okay? That's what I would take away from that first section of the course. Okay? All right, so now is when we get into the accounting. Okay? No amount of words can adequately explain this, so we're going to use examples throughout. So let's say that USP, which stands for US Parent, they're going to buy Target for $1,500. And you can see I haven't even told you how they're buying Target, and the answer is because we're assuming we're in that lower right box. Okay? We're acquiring the shares of Target. The parent recognizes and measures each asset acquired. <clears throat> and the table below basically explains um, what our facts are. Okay? So what you have to appreciate, and I think this table will make it a little clear, is for accounting purposes, okay, forget tax, accounting. So if you're an accountant, if you're the controller, and you buy a company for $1,500, the way you account for that is to take the 1500 and assign it to the assets and liabilities that you acquired. Okay? So unlike tax, where we just said you don't get a step up, books does have a step up. Because right? books puts on their balance sheet the fair value of what they acquired for the underlying assets and liabilities. Okay? So if I formed a company with $100 and the next day Philip buys it for 1500 he's going to put on his balance sheet that he got 100 of cash and 1400 of something else. Okay? So even though my balance sheet only had 100 of cash on it, he's going to put 1500 on his because that's what he paid for. Okay? So anytime a buyer acquires a target, buyer puts on its accounting balance sheet the fair value of what it acquired, the underlying assets and liabilities. Okay? So when you see that first column here where it says fair value, so that's what books is going to put on their balance sheet. Okay? Tax, since we're in that lower right box in that matrix, our basis in our assets is whatever our basis in the assets was the day before. Okay? It's just a carryover historical basis. Okay? And so we threw out some facts. This is arbitrary. We said our PP&E had a slightly lower tax basis than the fair value, and our intangibles and goodwill had no tax basis. So this fact pattern, super common, right? This is what most acquisitions look like, right? Some group of people had an idea, they funded it with a small amount of money, um, it was a little operation, right? These guys are sitting in the garage, and then all of a sudden, big company comes along, pays a lot of money for them, but that target didn't have a lot of basis in intangibles or goodwill, right? They just had some people with an idea, right? That's a typical acquisition setting. And so now we're going to figure out what should we do as the tax provision team when we have those facts. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so if we structured this, so just pausing on my theme that we're going to stay in that lower right-hand box. If we structured this first as a taxable asset purchase, okay. I, mean, I was trying to figure out what my tax basis was. My tax basis would be the same between book and tax because in a taxable asset purchase, my basis for tax purposes gets stepped up to whatever I paid. It's almost the exact same rule as exists for accounting purposes. Okay. And so that's nice because the thing that we're going to do first when we acquire a company, and when I say we, I mean we the tax provision people, we need to figure out how to determine 
whether when this company came over to us, whether they had any deferred tax assets or liabilities. Okay? Because even though the book guys are going to run off and accrue this on their balance sheet, they're going to put this on their balance sheet, they're usually going to forget whether there's deferred tax assets or liabilities that come with it. Or they'll just assume that's your problem and you're going to figure it out. Okay? So, what we need to do, anytime there's an acquisition, we need to compare what the book guys say their balances are, compare that to then what the tax basis is, and if there's any difference, we need to record deferreds. Okay, right from the get-go. Okay, and you'll see this in a second when we structure this acquisition not as a taxable asset deal, but as a stock deal. So in a taxable asset deal, it's super easy, right? If we bought $200 of fixed assets, our book basis is $200, our tax basis is $200. Everyone's happy. There's no difference. No one, you don't have to do anything. So if you don't show up to work that day and nothing happens, you probably got the answer right. Okay? That's good. Okay? The problem is most acquisitions aren't structured this way, so you won't look out into that situation very often. And even in some cases, um, you can have differences. Things get complicated once you just throw a few more facts at it. Okay, so if we said that this was a stock purchase, a okay, non-taxable stock purchase, so that means we bought the shares and we didn't make a 338 election. Okay, so note, so here's where it gets interesting. So note, our tax basis, the, that information was the, the amounts that came off of that page two slides ago, right? So we said I had some fixed assets and no basis in my intangibles or goodwill. Yeah. So the most basic thing you do when you acquire a company and you're a tax provision person, you go and you figure out, step one, what is the book basis? Step two, what is the tax basis? Is there a difference? If there's a difference, it's like a temp item. Okay. So, let's stop and just pause with fixed assets for a second. If Books is going to put 200 on its balance sheet, but my tax basis is only 150, what would happen if I sold those fixed assets for 200 bucks? Studi, what would happen? Studi. Or, you have a gain, right? If you sold your assets for book value, your book value is 200, and your tax basis is 150, you'd have a gain, right? You'd pay tax. So we've got, because we're putting that 200 on our balance sheet, we've got to tell the reader, hey, if you, if you sold that asset for book value, if you converted your balance sheet to cash, you would actually have to pay 20 a tax. So even though me as the seller, I would have said, I don't have any deferred taxes. This was, I don't know, I was just in my garage, right? <laughs> you as the buyer, you now have this real balance sheet where you put 200 of fixed assets on it. There's a basis difference. So you as the buyer have to put that deferred liability up on the balance sheet right now. Okay? And so notice, this isn't like the temp items we've been learning about in class so far, because in, in class so far, we've learned about how in year one, there's an add back, and then in year two, there's a deduction. And so it's a zero-sum game over the life of an asset. Okay? Here, this is not a zero-sum game. Here, the deferred liability just appears. Right? It appears through the magic of how book says all of a sudden they have an asset worth 200. And you for tax are saying, hey, wait a minute, I don't have an asset worth 200. I have an asset that only has a basis of 150. So there's that moment in time, that snapshot, where you have to say, all right, I guess I don't have an ad back followed by a reversal. What I have is I'm just starting like midstream. And so the day I book my opening balance sheet for an acquisition, I have to put those deferreds up there in anticipation of them reversing. But I never saw the other side of the equation. I'll get the reversal of the deferreds, but never the setup. 
The setup happens in purchase accounting. It happens when books puts new values for book purposes on all these assets. It's almost like you get a free shot at booking new deferreds. Okay. So, if you're a buyer and you say, look, I've got 200 of fixed assets with a tax basis of 150. If I sold my balance sheet for cash, I'd have a tax gain. I got to book a DTL. You're going to book that DTL and purchase accounting. Okay. We're going to treat that DTL as if it's like a liability assumed. Almost like you assumed accounts payable or you assumed a lawsuit litigation reserve or something like that. That DTL is going to look like another liability we got when we bought this company. Okay. Okay, the next one is a more, uh, even more typical example. Okay. So buyer pays 1500 Most of the purchase price goes to intangibles. Right? So you had that target. He was sitting in his garage. He's like, I got this great idea. Pay me a lot of money. So whatever you paid for must be some sort of like know-how or trade secret or patent or technology or something, right? I mean, that's like your typical Silicon Valley fact pattern. So Books is going to say, well, when we have to put that 1500 on our balance sheet, we should call that thing you mostly bought, that thing that was the value driver behind the acquisition, we should call that IP, intangibles, right? And again, it could be a patent, it could be you know, a half-baked, you know, idea on the next iPad. It could be whatever, right? But it's some intangible, it's something. And if it's identifiable, meaning that like, you could sell it, books will record it as a separate asset and put it on the books as an, as an intangible. So in this fact pattern, books said, of the 1500 you paid, 1000 was related to this intangible, okay? And they would get some valuation firm to go tell them of the 1500 they pay what this stuff is really applicable to. That's typical. Okay, so if we went through our steps, book basis is a thousand, tax basis is nothing, right? We don't have basis in intangibles, right? That guy just had an idea in his garage. There's no basis, right? He didn't buy the intangibles, or he didn't capitalize R and D or expense or anything like that. So we have a thousand dollar difference. So if we sold our balance sheet for cash, we sold our intangibles for a thousand for cash, we would have a tax gain of a thousand. Right? So that would mean that we would have to pay 400 a tax just to take what book says our balance sheet is and convert it to cash. So that 400, that's a giant DTL. Right? So even though we thought, oh, we're just paying 1500 bucks for this company, we're actually assuming a bunch of deferred liabilities here. Right? Because if we just turn that thing we just bought into cash, there's a lot of tax to pay. Right? Because there's very little inside tax basis in these assets. So just like the PP&E, we would book a 400 DTL for the um, basis difference that exists in IP. Intangible. So your job is to calculate that 420 and then like this green arrow shows, you gotta book it. Right? You gotta book a credit to DTL because you gotta get that DTL on your books. So now the question is what's the other side of the entry? So the other side of the entry is goodwill. Okay. And the reason it's goodwill, so let's just make sure we get on the same page on this one, because this is fundamental. So if I was buying a company, and let's say, oh, I'm not doing that. Okay, so let's say that I, um, I paid a thousand dollars for a company, and I assumed two hundred of liabilities. That must mean that the value of the assets is 1200 right? So if I had, let's say, like $100 of accounts receivable and 800 of intangibles, then that means that I have 300 of goodwill, because goodwill is the residual. 
Okay. So, if I go through this calculation again and say, oh, I didn't assume 200 of liabilities, there's actually a whole bunch of deferred tax liabilities I inherited too. I assume those in the deal. So that 200, let's say it becomes 550. Well, this 1200 now becomes 1550. These are still the same. They're not changed by the fact that I inherited deferred liabilities. So goodwill changes, right? As I change purchase price for assets, it just drops down to goodwill because my goodwill is my residual. So when I need to book my increase in deferred liabilities, I do it with an offset normally, not always. It kind of depends what the dynamic is. But, I, but the general entry you see most times is credit DTL, debit goodwill. It's the same entry you would book if you said, oh, I... I have another $50 of accounts payable I'm inheriting. I just, I didn't realize it, but apparently there's more, right? If you had that fact pattern, this would go up, and that would go up. Okay, makes sense? So it is extremely common to see a company record a tax entry in an acquisition that's a taxable stock purchase where they book deferred liabilities and they book an offsetting goodwill entry. Can't forget really get this. It's my mother's birthday. I'm going to call her on the way home. All right. Okay, so questions about that? So the basis of the budget will increase to um increase to uh seven hundred and seven hundred and twenty. For book purposes your goodwill went up. Mm -hmm. Alright. No, it it for book purposes if uh if there is uh any uh impact on the on the goodwill so it is your book goodwill is 720. That's right. Okay, so what's the question you should be asking me at this point? Other than can I leave? <laughs> what is the question you should be asking? Look at the example. What have we co what have we not covered yet? What's that? Somebody mumbled it. Who said goodwill? It's like inaudible. Is that you? Is that you, Connie? Anyways, goodwill is the right answer. Okay. So, so we have a third asset there, goodwill, that we acquired. Right? And we said, if we go through those three steps that I wrote up on the example there, our, our book basis in goodwill is 300. It'll soon become 720. The tax basis is zero, and there's a difference. But in the tax rate column, I said N-A. Why did I say N-A? So let's say that I booked, let's say I did the same thing with intangibles where I accrued that 400 DTL. Let's say I did that for goodwill. Okay. So I take my 300, I multiply it by 40%, it's 120. The journal entry I would book would be credit DTL for 120. Debit, goodwill for 120. Okay, well this isn't good because now I have another 120 of book goodwill. So that means I have another 120 difference, right? So if I went and did the 48 DTL for that, I'd credit DTL for 48 and I would debit goodwill again, right? So it becomes circular. So there's a rule in ASC 740 that just says don't book that DTL because now that's not making any sense, right? Goodwill is meant to be the residual, so it doesn't, you don't need to gross up the residual, right? That just, that's not economically helpful to anybody, okay? So the reason we book deferred liabilities for the first two rows and not for the third is we book a deferred asset or liability for anything that's not goodwill, okay? We'll get to what the goodwill rules are in a bit, 
But in general, if there's book basis and goodwill and not tax basis, you don't record a DTL. Okay. What if there's a DTA instead of a DTL? Well, then you'll book it. And then your next question is, is it going to be circular? And the answer is yes. And your next question is, is that confusing? And the answer is definitely yes. <laughs> That rule changed recently. It used to be the answer was no, but that rule changed about half, uh, half a dozen years ago, and now you book the DTA. It, I can't even remember an acquisition I worked on where there was a DTA, and so it's rare, very rare. But it can happen for sure. Most deals, I mean, at least 75% 70 of the deals I see are like this example, which is more complicated numbers but it's the same facts. It's a big step up for books, it's big deferred liabilities, it's a large entry to the balance sheet. This is typical. Okay? All right. So, I think we covered this more or less. Okay, this borders on confusing, but uh, let's try it. Always the buyer, right? Remember, the buyer is trying to show on its balance sheet what it just acquired. And the seller is like, give me my money, I'm leaving town, right? <laughs> so usually when... Um, you know, a big company buys another company. Let's say a public company buys another public company. You won't even see the last financial statements for the target. They just will never be filed. They just disappear. They're just going, going, gone. But then on the buyer's financials, you'll see them show up. But you'll see them reflected as the new value, what was paid for them. So it's like a brand new, fresh start. That's what you see. Well, for book purposes, they disappear. For, for tax purposes, of course, the seller has a, or the target, has an end to its life as a target, and then the next day, it's part of buyer, right? So if this is a U.S. company that is our target, and let's say our buyer is another U.S. company, and we, we do the acquisition on November 11th, yesterday. So target will file its last tax return, ended... November 11th, and it'll have a balance sheet that reflects kind of its life as of November 11th. And then on November 12th, it'll join the buyer's group. And so it'll be part of that consolidated tax return starting with November 12th. But on its opening balance sheet for that target, it'll reflect all those new book values. So it won't look like the target from one day ago. It'll look different on the balance sheet because it'll have all those fair value numbers for, for book purposes, not for tax. So if it was depreciating a truck, it's still going to depreciate the same basis, same truck, nothing will change. But when you look at the balance sheet for the tax return, it'll, it'll reflect that book step up because that's a book balance sheet. Make sense? Okay. So um, let me kind of jump in front of this slide and, and try to explain one thing that might be helpful. So let's say that um, let's say that I acquire a company and I pay a thousand for them, and um, <clears throat> let's say that the uh, basis. Okay, so that's book value. Let's say that I have zero tax basis. Adjusted basis is what A B is for tax and goodwill, okay? So book basis and goodwill is 1,000, tax is zero, okay? And so when is goodwill expense for book purposes? When it's impaired. So the answer is it's not, generally. 
So it's not amortized like over five years or ten years or anything like that. Goodwill just sits there, but it could be impaired. Okay? So if you paid a thousand bucks for a company and then you look at it one day and you're like, man, this thing's only worth like 200, right? Then you have to impair 800. Okay? And so impairments are based upon what companies do to go back and revisit the valuation of the business that they acquired and compare it to what's carrying value. Okay, so it's kind of common sense. So if you impaired it for uh, $800, your journal entry is going to be debit expense for $800, credit goodwill for $800. Okay? What is the tax entry we would book for that? Okay, so does it affect our payable? Do we get a deduction for the 800? No. We don't have any basis in it. Do we get a deferred for it? No. Right? We remember we didn't set up a DTL originally. We said no DTL because of that rule I explained. And now, books is impairing it, so that temporary difference is shrinking, but I still don't have a deferred. So I have no payable impact, no deferred impact. I have no provision benefit for that loss. Right? So this looks like a perm item. Right? So this is a big old perm. It is not good to have a giant book expense with no tax benefit. Right? Because that will show up in your effective rate as a bad guy. But that's what impairments tend to be. Okay. So <clears throat> let's um, let's take this example now, and let's change it up a bit. Okay. Let's say I'm just going to mark in red what changed. Let's say that our tax basis was 150. Okay. All right. So for tax purposes, we get to amortize goodwill over 15 years. Right? So let's say for 15 years, books just sits there and keeps their $1,000 of goodwill, but tax deducts that um, 150 a basis. Okay. Oh, remind me to tell you a funny story about that email thing. You guys will like it. So, <clears throat> if I had $150 of tax basis in my goodwill, I would deduct it over 15 years, $10 a year. Okay. So every year, what I would do is I would debit my payable because I would save money. I have no idea what I just did. I would debit my payable for 10. And I would credit, now here's the zinger, I would credit a DTL for 10. And the reason is, is I would take that 1,000 and I would treat it as essentially 850 of book goodwill where there's no tax basis, and 150 of book goodwill where the book and tax basis are the same. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm amortizing this for tax purposes. And now I'm saying that <clears throat> over time I'm deducting this. But in the future I will have an event where I convert my, if I sold my balance sheet for cash and I sold that goodwill for 150, I'd have a tax gain. So the, ta so the accounting rules are funny because what they do with goodwill is they ask you to bifurcate goodwill between amounts that you have no tax basis for and amounts that you do have tax basis for. Okay. So this is called component one and this is called component two. Okay. So on day one you book nothing 
nothing on day one, because there's no basis difference. But over here, over time, you treat it like a temp. Whereas this, you book nothing on day one, and any impairment in the future is a perm. So let's say, let's say I book this entry right here for 15 years. So I accumulate a DTA of 150, a DTL of 150. If I booked an impairment, and let's say I book an impairment just to make it easier. Let's say I impaired the entire 1,000. My tax entry is going to be debit DTL for 150 credit provision. This assumes a 100% tax rate. Um, I haven't tax affected these things. But in effect, I do get a provision benefit for my component one goodwill. So any aspect of goodwill that is component two, whenever it's impaired, it'll be a perm. But any aspect of component one, when there's a book expense, there should be a provision benefit for it, because you had basis originally. Okay. So if you ever have goodwill where there's some tax basis, just know that that general rule of there's no deferreds and it's always a perm, that that turns off, and you have to do this bucket one, bucket two thing. And that's what this, this graphic is trying to show you. Okay, and maybe this is going to be more, more articulate than what, what I was describing. But focus on, um, focus on this box for the moment. Okay. So when book goodwill is greater than tax, right? Our thousand of book goodwill is greater than our tax of 150 in that prior example. So my component one would have been 150, component one is the lesser of book or tax, component two is the excess. On component one I have a future temp as I amortize it, on component two I have future perms, no DTO. This makes sense, I think, more as you go through an example, which I think in our in-class exercise, we're going to hit, hit an example where there's goodwill. Okay. So this is very common, though, when, you know, when times are good, like the stock market's up right now, right? And so when the market's up, that means the valuation for assets is up. When the valuation for assets is up, you don't get impairments because nothing needs to be impaired if the value is high, right? So... When the financial crisis hit in 08, and it largely hit in Q4, or calendar Q4 of 08, meant every company was booking impairments. Uh, really common. Uh, Yahoo booked like a $500 million impairment. EA booked a giant impairment. Um, I felt like half my clients booked like massive nine-digit impairments. Because of all their acquisitions from the past, they were all sitting on the balance sheet, and everyone thought, hey, this is great, until all of a sudden everyone's stock prices dipped. And when all the stock prices dipped, people said, oh, well, the assets we bought must not be worth as much anymore. So you saw a ton of impairments. But you see, I haven't seen very many since. So um, you can make a career out of impairment accounting when the stock market tanks. Um, that's a moral story there. Okay, so let's see if we can... Um, let's see if we can kind of keep working through a different example and... Um, apply our concept here. So you'll see that the facts in this example, which again is a non-taxable acquisition, stock purchase with no step up, the facts are slightly different than before. So our PP&E is 200, so now there's no deferred related to fixed assets, and conveniently we said our tax basis is 1,000 in IP, and that was intentionally to, to simplify the example. 
But now, and this is the important part, now we're saying that the basis in goodwill that we have, we have both a book and a tax basis, and they're different. Okay? And that can absolutely happen. I mean, the way it happens is, and this, this is not uncommon, you know, company one goes out and buys company two, right? And then company three comes out and buys company one, right? And then company four comes out and buys company three, right? That happens all the time. And so if three acquisitions ago somebody bought assets, it's very easy to get tax basis and goodwill. That's how you do it, by acquiring assets. Okay. So it may not be acquisition, this acquisition that gave rise to tax base and goodwill, but it could have been a prior one. And it happens all the time. So don't assume just because you're buying the stock of a company, you don't have tax basis and goodwill. You have to think, well, did this company buy somebody else before and did they get tax basis and goodwill? You need to figure that out. It's easy to figure out. You just go to their tax return, right? See if they're amortizing goodwill. Okay, so those are our facts. We have book goodwill of 300, tax goodwill of 100. <clears throat> okay, so on day one, we don't do anything, but you can see on the little chart at the top, we, we carved up what our component one, our component two goodwill is. This is the lesser of book or tax, right? And this is the excess. So, as we amortize the 100, we're going to get a future temp difference, right, as we amortize. Day 2, or component 2, we don't do anything on day 1, because that rule says book no deferreds, but in the future, if there's ever an impairment, it's a future perm. Okay. back up to that. I know that's hard to hard to grasp. Um, if we have time when we go through the uh, Yahoo 10k later, maybe I'll pull up the 08 10k and show you kind of what their impairment looked like. Because when you look at their rate reconciliation, it'll look like they had a $500 million perm item um, for a gigantic book expense that was non-deductible. Just like that 800 in our example, it'll be the exact same thing. All right. Questions so far? Okay, so what you're going for? You're going for the record tonight. Um, I have a question about specifically the system. Um, this one doesn't make there is any difference between the purchase. The buyer makes their stock to the purchase, and the buyer makes their stock to the purchase, or the buyer makes actions cash to the buyer. Okay, hold that question. We'll come back. To, we'll talk about that at break for a few minutes. The answer is maybe. Okay, it depends, right? Like all good tax answers. So, okay, so what you should have been learning so far, you should have bought Red Bull for all you guys tonight. <laughs> what, what you should have learned so far is, books records the fair value of assets on the balance sheet. Tax, if we're in a stock acquisition, we have a historical basis. We need to find the differences between book and tax basis, and record deferreds for all those differences on day one, except for goodwill. Okay? This will be on the final, that specific part. Okay? So, books has fair value purchase accounting, tax has historical, identify the difference, record deferreds on day one. That deferred will not include the, day, the difference for goodwill. And you'll record that entry to, to set up those deferreds. You're going to record it through Goodwill. That'll be the other side of your journal entry. Okay? Because normally, think about how you've done provisions so far. Normally, you think, I put my payable up, I put my deferreds up, the provision falls out. Right? If you do your payable, throw a bunch of acquisition-related deferreds into your deferred, and you book the other side of the provision, that's not good. Right? I think you'll notice it's way wrong when you try to do your rate rack because you'll think, man, I should stop buying companies because it's going to cause a humongous expense to accrue these DTLs every time. But the answer is you don't expense it. You book it through the you book the debit side of the entry through Goodwill. 
Um, so as you can see, as, as the course goes on, our little three-step process kind of falls apart, right? The, the payable, the deferred, the provision falls out. It stops working when APIC gets involved, Goodwill gets involved. Pretty soon, it's not three things anymore. It's a lot of things. Okay. So when you isolate on just this acquisition uh, and the accounting, in this example, it's credit, deferred liability, debit, Goodwill. Okay, balance sheet entry. Okay. All right, let's take a short break now, and then um, and we'll keep rolling. Okay, so let's take a break for like 10 minutes.